Welcome to Sectorverse. Today we have Amit, uh, who is who's a hedge fund manager, uh, an investor, a founder, uh, right from New York City. Amit uh, was born in India, but was uh, raised in, in New York, Queens. He has been in, in the investing and hedge fund business for over 15 years now, and now has recently started Nifty Financials. He is an angel investor and looks at two different countries for investing, which is the US as well as in India. So Amit, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, it's six in the morning in, in New York, I guess. So, uh, oh yeah, because they have changed the uh, daylight saving as well. So I'm assuming it's seven or so, but thanks for joining and uh, appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. So Amit, uh, you know, we would probably just start off asking, uh, you know, uh, you were born in India, but you were raised in, in, in New York. How is, how is your upbringing? Uh, what was the different uh, sort of cultural uh, shift that you, that you kind of, you know, uh, took from India to the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, again, thank you for having me. I was born, uh, as you mentioned, in India. I'm fr originally from northern India. I moved to the U.S. when I was 10 years old. Um, I moved to Queens, uh, which, although it's officially a part of uh, the U.S., uh, I think it's a, a island of its own. Uh, it's probably the most diverse place on Earth uh, in terms of, um, you know, the, the, where the population comes from. Uh, so it's a fascinating place to grow up. Um, I went to high school in downtown New York City. Um, and so I had a one and a half hour subway ride every day, which is another great way to get to know the city. Um, and then when I went to college, it was in New Hampshire, um, which is very proper uh, America in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so all of these were sort of very interesting, um, you know, cultural differences from um, my upbringing. I think the one common theme uh, throughout all of this was um, marrying the um, academic excellence that's, you know, put on um, every Indian kid from their parents with um, a really healthy appetite for risk taking, which I think is like a, at that time was a very uniquely American trait. Um, now, obviously I think risk taking is celebrated globally, um, especially in India. But I think back then the idea that, um, you know, you could go to a liberal arts school and study whatever you want and then become whatever you want, um, I think was a cool American cultural trait that, that I picked up. Indeed, indeed. Uh, you know, so was it like you got interested in finance through the course of your young age or uh, was it just that when you went to Dartmouth, you know, you kind of took a lot of finance courses and then that led to, to, to your passion per se? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, everyone's interests are uh, a lot of times function of the times they're growing up in. And um, actually, when I was in high school, it was just the beginning of the dot com bubble. Um, so stocks were starting to go up. Um, you know, it's like, it seemed like every day you would just buy any random company stock and you would make a lot of money. Um, and obviously I went to high school, you know, in the shadow of Wall Street. Um, so it was, it was very natural for me to be interested in the stock market. Uh, I got an internship at Merrill Lynch um, when I was still in high school. And so um, after I used to finish my classes, I used to put on a tie and run across and work on the trading desk there. And so I just started learning about stocks um, and, you know, my, my interest grew from there. Um, and then, you know, after college, um, I actually was a double major at Dartmouth. I was a uh, economics and Spanish major, and I always thought I would do something more with my Spanish degree. Um, but then I wanted to come and live in New York and to afford New York. I realized I needed to rely way more on my finance degree. And, uh, you know, I, I started out in investment banking in Maryland. So that's, uh, that's how my career took off. Interesting. Uh, so you've, you've been in hedge fund forever now, right? So you've, you've, you've been in the business. You, you are a true blood Wall Street, uh, you know, uh, investment banker and, and, you know, hedge fund player as such. Uh, so how was your, you know, bringing um, in, in, you know, in terms of uh, starting off a career there and, and then, you know, staying through the peak at, at Axel Capital and then Adi Capital per se. Uh, so how was that experience? Yeah, I, I think what's really cool about working um, in the investment world professionally versus um, sort of investing on your own is you have access to a lot more resources. Um, you know, in terms of being able to attend conferences where you get to interact with management teams directly. Um, this is the kind of stuff, if you're a real stock junkie, that you love, right? You love being able to uh, listen to an earnings call and then show up to a conference or show up to a, an office and ask the questions that weren't asked on the conference call. Um, and so that's, I think that that's really what get, gets my juices going is to dig a little bit deeper uh, than, you know, what's out there at the surface. Um, I also grew up, you know, in a hedge fund world um, that really valued short selling as much as investing in companies. And uh, it's sort of a forgotten art because we've been in a bull market for the last five to six years. Um, but um, it makes you a very you know, good and skeptical person. And it makes you a good investor on both sides if you know how to short stocks. 
Um, I think that's that's you know another something that that, that although I've been investing personally for my entire life to invest professionally, uh, that tool is pretty important. Um, so, so I think th th those two things were a big game changer relative to you know just uh, reading annual reports and investing based on that. Very cool. Uh, so you you've been through the cycle of you know uh, of of being at the top and and. Uh you attained the highest uh, calling of mankind uh, being in hedge fund per se but what kind of uh, got you started with starting your own etf uh, in f in the us uh, and and uh, how was that uh, you know how was the idea per se uh, that kicked in your head that okay i got to start something of this this sort as well yeah yeah uh, so my etf is called indf it's the nifty india financials etf it's the first uh, pure play etf that's focused on indian financial sector um, there are, uh, before we started INDF, uh, there were, there were I think, about 10 or 11 India-focused ETFs. Most of them just track the benchmark indices. Um, so it's a way for you to invest across the Indian stock market without much focus as to what sector you're investing in. And um, the background to, to this is, um, you know, when, when I moved here and when I was investing um, professionally, mostly in the US and European markets, um, I think it was a cool thing to be skeptical about India. Um, like, it was cool to just always complain about, you know, how much corruption there is and how there's no economic growth and how much inflation there is. And, um, and so it was always like, yeah, if you want to put your money, put it in the U S and, um, you know, India is just one big mess. And I had a completely, you know, different view to that. I had a very contradictory view where I said, um, as a global investor, if you look across the world, uh, you're probably not going to find any other land that is going to grow, uh, for high rates for a really long period of time. Um, and this is very structural. It's uh, all based on, demographics where uh, you know India has one of the best population pyramids in the world in terms of young people versus old people uh, it's based on urbanization and I think most importantly it's based on uh, back then you know five to ten years ago the Indian uh, dreamers and entrepreneurs that were creating internet infrastructure uh, you know to bring smartphones for everyone so so I had this uh, contrarian view and in my experience uh, you make the most amount of money when you're a contrarian um, you can make decent money when you're consensus, but it's really when you're contrarian, when you, when you make the most amount of money. And I said, hey, wait a minute, everyone is skeptical in India. I'm bullish. I need to do something about this. Um, and then on top of that, you know, the, the, the cool thing that um, my professional investing upbringing brought me was this idea that um, not every business is worth investing in. Right. There are a lot of cool stock stories that you hear, you know, at a cocktail party from your uncle, from your friend. And they're usually these like flash in the pan. They go up and then they crash type stories. Um, but there's a set of companies out there and, you know, the, the professional investing world knows this, that are just great companies. Um, they have a lot of moat around them, so they, they don't have a lot of competition. They earn very high returns. Um, and the key is in every single geography and theme to find those kinds of companies. And I firmly believe that in India, um, that sector is financial and fintech. Um, and, you know, we could go in, into more why, but, but basically I come to the conclusion that the financial sector was the sector worth investing in in India, and um, I was bullish on India when the world was skeptical. Uh, so it seemed like the perfect uh, sort of thing to do from a startup perspective. Um, and, uh, you know, we launched in the US. And so, so part of it is not just that, that um, you're bullish on India and you have a chance to invest in India, but this is a way for US investors to go into India, which also eases the pain for them from a regulatory perspective. They don't have to get FPI licenses or, you know, register and they don't have to wake up like I do at three in the morning to trade. Um, so, so all of these things sort of help you know, help help the U.S. investors from a ETF perspective. That's very interesting. Uh, you know, you giving opportunity to a lot of uh, folks in the U.S. to to directly invest through an ETF in 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 the U.S. markets per se. Uh, and so, how, so I'm assuming that you kind of you know split your time in the U.S. as well as in India. Uh, how does that work? Because that must be hard. Right? You said that you probably wake up three in the three in the morning to 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 realize that you got to trade then. Right. So how does your time kind of go in, in looking at uh, certain trades and, and, and tactics in India versus, say, the U.S.? Yeah, the, the good news is, um, you know, once you figure out how to invest in good companies, um, management teams do most of the job for you. Um, it's like a luxury to be an investor uh, because you just sit back and someone shows up to work and makes money for you. Um, I don't think there's any, you know, I, I, I have not come across any other career like that. Um, but the whole key is to, like, learn how to invest only in good companies if you um, investment companies where you have no idea what you own, um, where, you know, uh, there's a lot of competition, there's a lot of regulatory risk, uh, then your hair goes white real quick because all you do is spend your time worrying about re reports that are coming out and results that are coming out. So um, I think the, the good thing about 
um, you know, knowing what you own and being a pan geographical investor is you have the luxury to pick really, really good companies. Um, and then the, the nuances are um, every macro is different. Um, you know, every economic cycle is different. Um, India will have a different inflation cycle in the US. Um, there'll be a different, um, you know, government uh, regulations in the US. There'll be an infrastructure bill in one geography and, you know, accelerated uh, tax cuts in another geography. So those things is, is how I spend most of my time um, relative to, you know, worrying about if the company is good or not. I, you know, I, I believe I invest in some of the best companies around the world. And, um, you know, they're the management teams, as I said, just do all the, all the good work. That's, a, that's probably the most interesting point where, you know, kind of stock pickers need to look at, uh, instead of looking at, you know, just the company, the, the products that they have, the services, uh, be it startup or a, or a big company, you look at the management, uh, you know, sort of uh, the, the, the folks who run the company, the management size of it, right? So how do you pick the right set of management uh, folks who can run the company? Yeah, um, I mean, part of it is um, in any company, there is, um, you know, the, the desire to maximize today's revenue and today's profits. Um, I think some of the best management teams put away a lot of their uh, current revenue and current profit into future R&D. Um, that's something key to watch is uh, long term thinking. So, um, you know, I, I think it's really important to back um, founders because um, most founders will have long term thinking attached to them versus professional managers that, you know, want to make a quarter or a year. Uh, and that's something in the in the in the private markets that's less controversial because of course you're backing a founder. But in the public markets, um, you have a lot of companies that are run by founders and a lot of companies that are not run by founders. And I think if you start with companies that are run by founders, um, you know you'll 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 be in a good place. Um, and then beyond that, I think it's just uh, a lot of it's track record, right? It's um, you have a new management team show up. Where did they come from? What did they do at their last company? Um, this is all very relevant, uh, by the way, for um, the Indian private sector banks because. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, they went through a big credit cycle. They had a lot of NPLs on their balance sheets. And um, I think four, four out of the top six top financial companies in India hired new management teams. They, they pretty much somehow got rid of their, um, their old managing directors and hired new ones. And it became very relevant to say, where did these people come from and what are they going to do? And, you know, in fact, one of the best performing stocks uh, recently has been ICICI Bank. And so much of that company's performance has been because of their new management team. Um, right. So it was all about, um, you know, how is the new CEO going to fix the balance sheet? Um, so, so, so I think those kind of things are important just to uh, either back founders or figure out where management came from and what they did there. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, so, so now that we know that, you know, you kind of look at the management team per se, uh, how do you go ahead and pick the right set of, uh, you know, your uh, financial institutions in your uh, ETF? with the right proportion, because I think, you know, uh, the mixture of the proportion is probably the most important thing after the management team. And I'm assuming uh, that's where, you know, you get, you see your returns over a period of time. So how do you do that? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, it was very important for me for the ETF to represent the entire financial sector. Um, it was very popular, uh, you know, just to invent, invest in bank nifty, uh, but I wanted it to be the entire financial services sector. So it's the uh, top 20 financial services companies in India. It, it's not just the banks. Uh, it's also life insurance companies, um, you know, eventually uh, other types of financial services, fintech companies. Um, and, and so that's important because I think the entire sector is growing, you know, more than just the banks. Um, the proportion is, it's, it, it, this is a really interesting um, debate that we had is um, you either say, I'm going to buy sort of equal amounts of the big private sector banks and, um, you know, the, 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 the fintech and other financial services companies, or you say, um, the market decides who's winning and I'm going to let my winners run. And uh, this is something cool that I think investors have a tough time doing. So when a stock goes up a lot, you, the first thing you want to do is sell it. And you, know, you want to hold on to your losers and you keep selling your winners because it's working. Um, and I really wanted to avoid that temptation. So the way we've set up the ETF is that um, it buys the top 20 companies um, by their size. So it's ranked by size. And so as a company gets more and more successful over time, it gets a bigger and bigger weight. And as a company sort of languishes over time, it gets a smaller and smaller weight. And the ETF every six months will increase weights and decrease weights based on the company size. Awesome, awesome. Uh, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a great way of looking at how exactly you'll probably, you know, invest in, in a certain set of companies. Uh, and the idea is, is, is the fact that uh, you have got out an ETF when, the, when, you know, essentially when the tech has already kind of become so hot in the market, right? Uh, Tech was always booming. Uh, you've been in, in, in the whole dot-com crash. You've seen that. You've also seen the ages where the Apples and the Amazons have, have grown to tremendous amount of sorts, right? Uh, 
just let's shift uh, towards uh, technology and 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 finance uh, because uh, the the day and age that we're looking at uh, we're seeing today uh, of how a bank was in in an enclosed uh, brick and mortar uh, sort of a setup it has come down to an application right uh, how how exactly do you see uh, you know or or how exactly did you envision something like a change like this uh, over a period of just 10 years or so uh, um, and 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 uh, what was the thoughts that went through uh, in all of Wall Street when when you know such change was happening at a, at a rapid pace? Yeah, so um, this is where India is very unique relative to both other emerging markets and the U.S., where India has a banking system that's roughly divided between public sector banks and private sector banks. Um, private sector banks did not exist until 1992, so it's a very new um, business model, even though it doesn't feel like it. And what's cool, you know, again, talking about timing and product market fit, um, these private sector banks were born in a tech forward environment. You know, they were born when the internet had already existed and, um, you know, when we'd moved from mainframe to client server already. Um, and so they were always tech forward. And what we've been seeing is that because they're tech forward, uh, every tech evolution allows them to take more and more market share faster from the state run banks. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the top 10 apps on the Google Play App Store, um, but on, on the finance section, a bunch of them will be the private sector banks. Um, SBI has done a great job with the Yono app, which is up there, but beyond, beyond Yono, you don't see very high rankings for the public sector bank apps, whereas you see you know, very good rankings for the private sector banks. And how that's playing out in the finance world is that um, every single year, the market share gains of the big private sector banks are accelerating. Um, and you see that, you, know, you see the private sector banks report statistics like we're getting 80 to 90% of our transactions through our web or through our apps. Um, that for me is called fintech. Um, you know, these are no longer just banks. They are actual fintech companies when you get 80 to 90% of your interactions through uh, tech channels. Um, and they're really starting to move way deeper into, um, you know, uh, actual loan disbursements. Um, so uh, I think some banks are starting to report between 30 and 40% of mortgage disbursements are now fully automated. Uh, including um, application KYC and dispersal. Um, that's unheard of, uh, you know, even in the US where, um, uh, you know, you don't have those kind of figures. And so that's a really important point for India specifically, because in the US, um, we don't really have state run banks. And so when FinTech shows up, it eats away at market share of all banks. It is a risk to the banking system, period. Same in Europe. Um, in India, it's very special. When FinTech shows up, it actually helps the private sector versus the public sector. So um, I think as long as your portfolio is mostly private sector, um, fintech is helping. Interesting. And 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 what do you think about the whole uh, you know the payment systems that is out there in, in India versus the US? I'm assuming you'd have you know used both the payments uh, that is underlying with the UPA as well as say folks like uh, in in the US where Apple Pay, Venmo, and Zelle have been used prominently, but in India uh, with with uh, G Pay, Phone Pay, etc. Uh, what differences do you see and uh, the transaction wise India has been leading per se uh, so but but would love to hear your thoughts on that yeah I think the most interesting point is the fact that um, the payment system the payment rails in India were effectively non-profit funded right from from uh, government plus banks uh, as a consortium and what that means is that um, the 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 rate at which you transact is very low um, you know the MDR merchant discount rates in India are tiny compared to anywhere else in the world um, that is great for both merchants and for consumers from a financial inclusion perspective. And what that means is that um, the big payment companies just can't be you know, fat and happy with their payment profits because there is no profit in the actual payment or there's very little profit in the actual payment. And it really forces you to innovate to say, okay, I have a lot of payments, I have a lot of customers, but to make money off of them, I really need to come up with other services that are more interesting than this payment. So uh, you know, if you look at um, the PayPal's of the world, it took them a long time because they were making 2% on every payment transaction. It took them a long time to innovate. Um, and their innovation was an acquisition of Venmo. Their innovation was they started giving out loans. They, they, they sort of experimented with it and then they pulled back. Uh, now they're moving into buy now, pay later. But these are tiny, teeny steps because they still make so much money on the actual payment. Um, in India, every payment app is becoming a super app um, where you're literally getting to you know book your um, your movie theater seat on your payment app. That's something that's unheard of in the US. Um, and so I think it, it was a blessing in disguise that you make basically no money on the payments because it's forcing the app makers to be a lot more um, innovative on other stuff that they're offering consumers. For sure, for sure. I think uh, the whole payment ecosystem personally have, have used payments in about four different countries. 
I've, I've realized the seamlessness that uh, UP has gotten, uh, no other country has gotten per se, right? Uh, particularly because, uh, you know, it doesn't act like a wallet system, but acts direct bank to bank transactions, uh, unlike, you know, other countries where, uh, you know, wallet was the, the go-to uh, option for payments, right? Uh, uh, now that we know about the payment stack uh, per se, uh, let's let's talk about something which is very hard and interesting in India, right? Uh, the whole uh, investing cycle that we're seeing in the investing applications, right? Since it's very close to 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 what we do on a day to day basis, uh, uh, not a lot of Indians kind of invested prior to COVID nineteen, right? Um, nearly just three percent of, of of all the retail participation we saw, uh, probably less than that. Uh, versus say the US, 55% of them actually kind of you know invested in, in public markets per se. Uh, what do you think uh, in terms of the whole tech revolution in, in, in retail participation has, has played a role per se? And uh, where do you think this would go in terms of uh, India's uh, public uh, markets per se? Yeah, yeah, it's a really um, you know interesting concept. Um, a couple of years ago, someone invented this acronym in the US and it's called TINA. And it stands for there is no alternative. And it sounds very dark, but um, it's very simple, which is that when the Federal Reserve lowers the interest rate to zero, um, there is no alternative for you but to invest in the stock market to try to make money. And um, you know, I've always thought India would have its Tina moment. Um, and what was holding it back was that interest rates um, were kept very high in India for a long time. So you could just make a fixed deposit at six or seven percent. And believe it or not, that was actually equal to what the Indian average equity return was for the longest time. Uh, so two things changed, um, and they're, they're interrelated. One is that, um, you know, as a reserve bank has lowered rates, now you're getting fixed deposits at three to four percent, and so your bar for making money in the stock market has gone down. Um, and you know, as the economy has liberalized, and over time, more private sector institutions have taken share from state-run institutions, the returns have gone up in the stock market. So it's no surprise to me that you know. Recently was the Tina moment for India because it was really during COVID that the interest rates were lowered so much that you really can't make money in your bank account anymore. Uh, people were also not spending money. They weren't going out to spend money. And so the money started going into the stock market. Um, that is great. That is, uh, you know, that is how economies uh, take off is when uh, people have, companies have access to the equity markets, the debt markets. Um, I think the, the big risk is how do you not make that happen into a bubble? Um, you know, where, where you just follow one or two meme stocks that just go up hundreds and thousands of percent, um, you know, and then people lose a lot of money on them. And then, you know, they pull back from the stock market. That's a real risk. Um, so let's keep going back to, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, education required in terms of what makes a good business. And uh, what you see across the cycle is even the best businesses in the world will give you really good attractive um, entry and exit points. And the whole point is for you to study a couple of businesses, say, I love this business. I'm going to wait for a good entry point and I'm going to wait for a good exit point and you know, trade that way. Um, but I, th I think secularly, um, India's Tina moment has arrived. I think, um, you know, I, I don't see how people are ever going to make um, eight or nine percent on their fixed deposits anymore. So I think the the. The, the money flow to the equities market is here, definitely here to stay. So now that India's Tina moment has arrived, uh, much of, uh, you know, uh, Indian startups uh, or, or, you know, startups that were formed a decade ago um, have also kind of, you know, tried to figure out their uh, Tina moment, but the only place where they can find is, you know, go listed in the markets, right? We've been seeing Zomato, uh, as bumper IPO, um, you know, uh, Nika is coming in, uh, you know, ATM is, is, is on its way. Uh, what are your thoughts on on uh, this new age uh, platform aggregators kind of getting listed uh, on the on the markets? And uh, we could go company by company once you kind of you know let your thoughts know. Yeah, yeah, I know um, that's a it's a good point. You know, as I mentioned, uh, first you have to identify if it's a good business or not a good business, and second you have to identify if the entry and exit valuations are attractive or not. Um, I think the the companies that are going public in India today are fantastic. Um, you know, what you get with the internet is um, very high returns on capital because there's no bricks and mortar infrastructure, especially after, uh, you know, AWS and the cloud. Um, and what you get is the ability to really dominate competition. Um, these are things you didn't used to get in the old world um, business models. Um, on the other hand, I think valuations are very high for a lot of Indian IPOs. Um, and what's really interesting is that, um, you know, they're, uh, they're not, just because they're high doesn't mean that um, they are, they don't, they don't have, they're not grounded in something financial or something mathematical. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, you take Paytm, I think it's got a price at close to 30 times, you know, forward revenue. 
Um, its closest comparable is PayPal, which trades at around eight or nine times forward revenue. And so, you know, on one hand, you're saying, am I going to buy this uh, fintech company for three times the valuation of what's available to be the public markets? Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, Paytm is trying to tell investors, and I think investors are, are, are on board with this, that we could grow at sustained high rates for a really long period of time. Um, because uh, penetration of financial products is so low in India, uh, you know, we're going to sell uh, life insurance, we're going to sell mutual funds, uh, we're going to have data on people to, uh, you know, better have loan offers. Um, also, we're going to have an e-commerce store where we're going to sell uh, movie tickets and train tickets and plane tickets. Um, and we could continue to grow at high rates for a really long time because, you know, even eight, eight or nine years from now, if we're still growing at 20 to 30% a year, the penetration rate is still ne not nearly full. So I think what investors are doing is they're pricing things high and discounting them back for, you know, high growth for a really long period of time. And when all is said and done, uh, you know, you could still make okay returns on that, that thesis, which is that um, I'm going to pay a lot, but I'm going to grow a lot faster for a long period of time. Um, and so, you know, I'll make, I'll make the, the same returns I would just investing in any other financial services or fintech company. Uh, but I think for, from an investor that's trying to trade perspective, um, you know, as opposed to if you're going to be in the stock for 10 years, um, it's a lot more relevant that you're going in at a very high valuation because, um, you know, the question you have to ask yourself is, I love this company. Let's say the stock starts falling. When am I going to start buying it again? Or when am I going to buy more? And it's a lot tougher when you start off at a very high valuation because, you know, say tomorrow the valuation goes to, you know, 20 times revenue versus 30 times. Um, will you say, this is so cheap, let me buy more? Or will you say, let me wait until it goes to 10 times? Uh, and that's a little different for when things are fair valuation and you just wake up and the stock is down and you say, this is easy. This is very cheap. I want to buy more. Um, so I think that's, that's the question people should ask themselves is if you love a company and the stock goes in the opposite direction that you expect it to, at what point, you know, are you comfortable buying more? Um, and so, so currently, I think that's, that's how valuations are being justified is uh, the growth will be a lot more for a lot longer. Um, uh, but, you know, that doesn't change the fact that these things are coming out much higher than uh, global comps. You know, there's, there's this very common question in terms of, uh, you know, not just uh, retail investors, but also in terms of uh, a lot of the other side of investors like value investors, right? They look at, uh, they've been looking at, profitability of, of a company they've been looking at you know is the company kind of not bleeding a lot of cash uh, versus say just the growth uh, aspect of it right so um you know how and, and and rightly so because you've got like brilliant companies out of the same uh, model right amazon has followed that model was in kind of generating cash for 17 years or so uh, but a lot of these companies that followed a similar pattern as Amazon fail through the process, right? Uh, not a lot of companies would kind of, you know, exist in the long run per se. Uh, what do you think in terms of, or what blend do you look at, uh, you know, in terms of growth versus revenue and profitability? Yeah, I think the KPI that really matters to me is actually incremental margin. Um, and what that is, is basically forget what your margin is today or how much cash you're burning today. For each additional dollar of revenue that you generate, how much flows to to your bottom line? Um, so it's not it's not your cost base today. It's that as you grow, are you leveraging your cost base? And some of the best companies in the world they have a very high cost base today because they're spending a ton of money on R and D. They've hired a ton of employees that are going to drive future sales. But they they have such good business models. Like their gross margins are very high. Um, their contribution margins are very high. That each additional dollar that they make, a ton of it flows to the bottom line. And I think if you have a company with good incremental margins, um, that's all you need to care about uh, in terms of will this be a sustained company. Um, and you see this a little bit with you know, the story that PTM is telling, which is that um, their contribution margin has been increasing because they had a lot of costs, so they were losing money, um, but each additional dollar of revenue for them is leveraging their, their uh, cost base as cashback offers have decreased and you know, as marketing has come down. Um, so as incremental margins are good, that gives you some sense that the company is in good shape. Uh, in fact, it's probably a bad idea to look at a company that has, um, you know, maximizes profitability because um, there's so much global competition out there that if you are trying to take every single dollar and pay it to your shareholders, um, you're probably doing a disservice in terms of your future growth. Interesting. Uh, you know, so, so, but there have been a lot of companies that have, you know, kind of have increased their, uh, you know, their, the revenue base over a period of time. Uh, versus the, the the profits per se. So how would you kind of uh, uh, you know look at the fact that uh, uh, the growth for for companies like these in terms of uh, say you know the the 
the user growth versus the revenue growth would would that matter a lot more in terms of any sort of other parameter for these startups yeah i mean i think i think users versus revenue growth is very important because if your uh, users going up and you're getting no revenue out of it or out of them and you're getting no revenue growth it means that there is a, a product market fit problem um right if you can monetize your revenue um however if you're getting revenue out of your users and it's not falling to the bottom line because you're investing in the next big R&D project that's going to change the world. Um, I think that's totally fine as long as you can show investors that um, the potential for profit is there, uh, you know, through what I said, the, the incremental margin where um, your additional revenue is generating some additional profit. Interesting. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, um, let's, let's talk about the whole, uh, you know, the, the e-commerce and, and, and the logistics space in India, right? We know that the market is huge, um, you know, potentially, you know, the folks are, are talking about India being the next China, but India is the next India in general, right? So you, we've got our own uh, set of flavors and and and, uh, and the population kind of, you know, uh, is right there. What do you think about startups like Nika, where uh, a PR D2C player, uh, they serve India as well, but, but assuming that they're going to kind of serve the uh, rest of the world as well in the near future to come? Yeah, I think what's um, what's interesting about e-commerce is that um, they generally tend to be winner-take-all markets. Um, so, you know, whenever whenever I think about any given uh, theme in tech, the the first question is: Is this a winner-take-all market, or is it a many people can win market? And that really changes the risk profile. Like, if you're going to be in a winner-take-all market, um, you have to do a lot more work to make sure you're backing the winner. Versus, you know, if it's going to be a market where many people can win, then um, you know you could spread out your bets. Um, e-commerce, because there's benefits to economies of scale, like the bigger you are, uh, the more you can reinvest in your business offer. Instead of, you know, in the US, Amazon used to be two-day delivery, then one-day delivery, and now it's moving to same-day delivery. It's a great example of, uh, you know, why there's a flywheel if you become stronger as you grow. Um, e-commerce is that where, um, you know, you get, as you get bigger, you should get better and you should uh, knock out the competition. And um, Nike is clearly showing that in its, in its space. Um, the other cool thing about uh, the beauty space is that it's a very high trial space. Um, so as opposed to a lot of other types of e-commerce where you just stick with the same product you've been buying forever, you don't like, you know, I probably don't change my toothpaste ever. Um, so I just care about where can I get the lowest uh, cost toothpaste. Um, in beauty and cosmetics, you constantly want to try out uh, new items. And uh, so there's a lot of value for a dominant e-commerce player that can you know, recommend and sell you other things. Um, so big data really makes a big difference. Um, and so, so these are a couple of really attractive elements um, on, in the e-commerce space um, that I think people you know, are, are gonna realize as, as sort of Nike becomes more mature as a company and educates in, its investors as to why this specific category is very special. Interesting. And you mentioned winner take all, and there's another segment where you know, this has been happening uh, in India, which is the food delivery space, right? Uh, food delivery is not new across the globe. Uh, you know, we, we were uh, fortunate enough to see the growth of it uh, during COVID, right? Because that's where folks had actually survived per se. Uh, the likes of, say, Uber Eats in the US, uh, Food Panda in the US, etc. cetera. Uh, and, 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 you know, um, in India, we've got Zomato and Swiggy, uh, you know, both of which uh, are, are growing at that pace and, and valued very, very high. It, uh, uh, so matter when it listed, uh, there's a meme going around that was actually valued higher than Tata Motors, which started up in 1947 or so, uh, 1945 rather. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on a food delivery uh, aggregator being valued so high? Uh, and, and, and what are your thoughts on its future projection in a country like India, where uh, you know cooking at home is, is the lifestyle to go? Yeah, cooking at home uh, is is a is a lifestyle. Uh, obviously, in in India, I think a lot of households have help, which does not exist in the U.S. And so, the U.S. it's uh, you come home after a long day of work, and you you have to either order out or you know spend hours cooking yourself. Um, but but that said, I think um, you know the uh, the the trend towards urbanization in India is changing a little bit of that. Um, uh, you know, I think I think demographics and young professionals really, as we've seen, um, you know, really help that trend. Um, I think what's what's interesting about food delivery is that it's converging very rapidly with delivery period. Um, and I think the companies that are going to succeed are companies that recognize that. Um, so what we're seeing in the US and Europe is that food delivery used to be a standalone vertical. Um, then there used to be a standalone vertical that was, uh, you know, 15 minute convenience delivery. Um, and so quickly you move from I'm going to deliver your food within 25 minutes to I will deliver you anything within 15 minutes. 
Um, and those total addressable markets are massive because now you're not, not just competing against, you know, someone ordering lunch or dinner and on average, you know, you get between six and eight times a month, you're getting people that are just using their daily needs uh, using delivery services. Um, so to the extent that food delivery companies can morph into that, um, I think the market will be positively surprised by how big the addressable market is. Um, the flip side of that is going to be in many countries and uh, not yet in India, the winner in 15 minute convenience delivery is different than the food delivery incumbent. And so it's a real challenge for the incumbents to figure out, you know, how to muscle their way into that space. Um, so I, th I think, you know, Zomato and Swiggy, they have this chance to become sort of uh, quick delivery champions. And I think that's, uh, that's worth a lot to the market. For sure, for sure. I think uh, the whole idea of, of uh, these companies, you know, kind of uh, competing with each other uh, is in itself showcasing that the market is kind of growing and uh, there are competitions out there which are giving good competition to the to the already unicorns in India, right? Uh, which is which is a great sign, per se. Uh, another, you know, um, uh, key aspect where India is kind of very nascent uh, and and the and the potential is huge is is insurance, right? Uh, we've seen the fact that uh, how policy bazaar has is, has been, you know, uh, in, in the news for quite some time now uh, because of its IPO, and uh, a lot of an LIC in in general kind of you know IPOing as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on the insurance sector uh, in India? And uh, what are your thoughts on these new age insure tech companies that also have a blend of fintech in them? Yeah, I'm personally quite bullish on um, insurance in India, specifically life insurance companies. Um, you know, it's one of the most underpenetrated uh, sectors in India. Um, something like only 3% of all the risks that need to be insured are covered today. That compares to around 60% in, in the developed world. Um, and even in developing countries uh, in Southeast Asia, the percent of risks that are covered are much higher than in India. And I think part of the historical issue has been um, the distribution was you know, done through either agents or through uh, bank channels. And uh, what we realized is in the modern world, you need to have a self-service distribution model. And it's only right now that you, know, you could go log on to uh, an app, whether it's your bank's app or whether it's a third-party app and purchase insurance. Um, and you, you could even purchase micro insurance for a bunch of different use cases. Um, that's a game changer. Um, you know, I, and I think as any economy and as any country grows, um, people, especially you know, as we hit this $2,000 GDP per capita uh, level that India is hitting and growing from there, um, people really start worrying about how am I going to provide for my family, you know, pay off my bills if something happens to me. Um, and that's usually when insurance takes off. So um, now is like a really good product market fit for both in terms of demand where people are you know wealthier than they were last generation but also supply where you could buy it a lot easier than you could ever before um and so this could be a you know a, a multi-decade growth trajectory interesting right so uh the fact that the whole health sector is getting a lot more expensive is pushing the insurance sector as well simultaneously um you know uh, that's 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 a good point to kind of uh, take us through the whole uh, idea of software and, and finance uh, getting, you know, merging together, right? We've, we've been witnessing uh, a lot of uh, banks are trying to become software companies and a lot of software companies trying to become banks uh, all across the globe, not just in the US, but also in India per se, right? Uh, where do you see the, the intersection of uh, various, uh, you know, um, segments or industries trying to merge at each other and, and products uh, being, you know, served to the clients and customers? Because uh, you know, fintech would want to do majority of the things because they have a distribution channel. A, a SaaS company would probably get into finance because they have the ability of, of the same as the distribution channel per se. Uh, where do you see this merge uh, happening, uh, you know, uh, in the US as well as in India? Yeah, yeah. I mean, conceptually, um, what's interesting is that, you know, our entire world runs on money, uh, right? We're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars. And what's basically happening is we're all moving from cash to digital. And somewhere along the way, someone decided that, um, you know, digital is worth a few tenths of a percent, uh, you know, two companies. And so all of a sudden, all of these trillions of dollars are getting converted into billions for fintech companies to take advantage of, which wasn't the case with cash. You know, cash you used to go to a cash register, uh, pay someone. And the only time someone made some money was that armored truck that used to collect all the cash and take it to the bank. But that wasn't a lot of money. Now, every single money that is being transacted, someone is making you know, 0.1%, 1%, 2% 1 on it. And the whole key is, can you find the companies that are making that? And, you know, obviously the, the OGs in that space are Visa and MasterCard that 
um, you know, make 0.1% of every credit card and debit card transaction that's happening, you know, in their geographies. Um, so that I think that's why fintech is so exciting is that uh, money is is what the world runs on, and for the longest time, transacting with cash was free, and now retailers have to pay you know some amount if, to someone, and that's going to be some fintech company. Uh, in terms of um, who fintech companies gain share from, that's a really relevant question, uh, and it's very important for investing. So in the U.S., what's been happening is um, the U.S. regulator is kind of cool with fintech companies eating the bank's lunch. Um, you know, you could in your in your Venmo wallet or your Cash App wallet. Uh, you could hold on to cash and that's cool. And you could, uh, you know, transact on Square and PayPal and they can make their 2% and that's okay with everyone. Um, I think in India, the regulator is actually very protective of the banks uh, where, um, you know, they don't give out banking licenses very freely. Um, they don't, you know, they're very careful about what promoters uh, enter into the banking space. And so what that's leading to is that the FinTech companies are mostly sort of lead gen companies for the banks um, where the service that they're providing is better financial inclusion, you know, more customer leads, but it's ultimately the banks that are holding the deposits that are making the loans. Uh, so for now, it's a very symbiotic relationship. And that's great. Like if you invest in the whole financial sector, it's great if you have a mix of fintech and banks in your portfolio, because both are going to win um, just the way the regulatory system is set up. Part of the reason why, you know, you started in depth because you probably will have a slice of the technology in the fintech space in India as well, right? Uh, uh, yeah. So, so when this is happening, the whole fintech revolution and the and, and you know a lot of these tech gens are are, are starting off in India, uh, we are seeing a, a, a tectonic shift in the whole technology space as well, uh, and and that is through you know blockchain, cryptos, uh, DeFi's, you know um, Web three protocols have suddenly you know kind of uh, come out in the market per se. Uh, what are your thoughts on 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 you know the whole finance uh, gig? You know, kind of, kind of seeing a tectonic shift, and how would that play out versus uh, the the current Web two internet uh, protocol products per se? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's so so interesting. Um, sometimes I like to think that uh, crypto is made for India, and that's because it's inherently a trustless society. And I think, in, you know, when I think about India, it's like it's a trustless society, right? You you just trust your family, and that's about it in terms of doing business with someone else. And so, um, if there's any place where um, you know, you don't want to trust anyone. Uh, it's going to be uh, in, in, you know, in crypto and in India, which is really ironic and interesting. Uh, but the one thing I keep going back to is this idea of, um, you know, incremental margins, where it's the core of tech investing, which is uh, as you grow, your ability to, to lower costs for your customers should be better. Um, and you should, you know, leverage your fixed cost base. So you have uh, less and less costs as you grow. Um, and I think that the, the issue with crypto as taking over the financial system rails is that um, verification actually gets more expensive as you grow. So, um, you know, the, the last Bitcoin that will be mined to verify, um, you know, Bitcoin on the blockchain will be very expensive um, as more and more Ethereum is used up, the price of it goes up. Uh, so when you need to verify an Ethereum transaction, you actually pay more tomorrow than you will today and then you did yesterday in theory. Um, and so, so I think that's something that that needs to be thought through in terms of um, you know, crypto is a really interesting store of value uh, that is now being proven out where people are saying, I'm going to put 1%, 2%, 3% of my portfolio in crypto just to have a store of value that's not the equity market. Um, but is it a good, uh, you know, is it a good transactional rail for banking systems? And generally, the best transactional rails need to get cheaper over time, not more expensive, uh, the more transactions you do on them. Very cool. Um... You know, now that we've 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 seen the the way uh, that India is moving in terms of crypto, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, crypto accounts. Uh, you know, a lot more being open than the DMAT accounts in India. Right? So there are ten crores of sorts, uh, various crypto accounts in India, and and a lot of folks actually hold various kinds of cryptos versus um, the public, you know, public players as such. Uh, what are your thoughts on um, you know? A lot of these folks kind of investing in in the random coins, meme coins, and 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 stuff, without you know having education of both the public markets as well as the whole crypto space. Because a lot of these folks who are entering are first time investors, and they're very very new to the market, right? Um, both you know public as well as crypto. What are your thoughts on that? And 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 uh, having seen the whole dot com boom as well as the 0708 crash. Uh, 
you, there is a, a thought that even this wouldn't end really well. But uh, you know, your thoughts on 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 how how to look at uh, such industries? Yeah, you know, it sort of goes back to uh, this issue of trust, where I think trust in a equity in a stock, but do I really trust that management team? Right in a in a country where you constantly have corporate governance scandals, it's like. Uh, I have the same same level of risk investing in a stock than I do in crypto. And I think what, that's actually kind of a, a, a sad state of affairs where people, you know, don't trust corporate governance. And I think what it, the, the only solution to that is to, uh, you know, find sectors, to find areas of the stock market where you could say, um, this is a good, clean sector. Um, you know, you're, it's, it's, not, it's not something that returns hundreds or thousands of percent uh, a year, but it gives you very, like, good compounding over a really long period of time. And so the core of the portfolio should be in, um, you know, I believe in good companies run by good management teams at fair valuations. And on top of that, I think investors um, always have uh, the enthusiasm to pepper their portfolio with more exciting things. And so it's not to say that um, meme stocks or crypto coins don't belong in a portfolio at all. It's just that the whole point of a portfolio is you, the bedrock of it is, you know, very good, stable companies with good, good corporate governance and, you know, with the extra money that you don't mind completely losing. Uh, you take a chance on stuff. And I think investors have always been taking a chance on things like, um, you know, companies with interesting stories. And it's that same investor that's taking a chance on crypto. Um, but it's very different from, you know, quote unquote investing, which is putting your money away for 10 years in uh, a really good sector that, you know, is going to compound for, you know, for a reasonable rate. All right. I think, I think that's a very good way to end, uh, you know, the discussion of the fact that, uh, you know, folks can, can have one or two percent of their portfolio put in these uh, chance, uh, you know, instruments. But eventually, the, the the probability of such instruments giving high returns is also there, and 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 the market is also kind of evolving. So that's that's a good chance for them per se. All right, Amit, uh, thanks for joining uh, us today. I think it was a it was a pleasure having you. Uh, the whole idea of of investing both in the U.S. and India across various products instruments. Uh, and and the and and you know knowing the whole fintech space from an in, angel investor like yours, uh, now that you're, you're you're angel investing in India as well, how do folks kind of reach out to you? Uh, you know, uh, and 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 what is the best sort of companies that you're looking at in terms of investing? Uh, yeah, so I, the sector, um, uh, the sector rather, right? Yep, yep. So I spend uh, virtually all of my time uh, looking at the fintech space uh, in India. So if you if you have a great fintech idea or if you're building something exciting, definitely reach out to me. Um, you could email me amit at nextfins.com. Uh, you could find me on LinkedIn, Amit Anand. Um, I think you know I think in terms of um, why I, I selected fintech, you know as I mentioned, I'm extremely bullish on financial inclusion. Um, I think that the idea of we just we spoke about the insurance sector, but there's so many different sectors within finance that are at the very early stages of just taking off, uh, specifically because now technology exists to allow them to take off. Um, and, you know, it's one of the, the best ways to play the growth of any country. So I think if you think about, um, I'm bullish on India, how do I play this? It's uh, financials and fintechs are usually a, a good place to start in terms of uh, capitalizing on that growth. Um, so, yeah, we're happy to, you know, to, to hear pitches and support um, entrepreneurs and teams. Uh, so, again, it's uh, LinkedIn, Amit Anand or uh, Amit and Nextfins.com. All right. Um... Awesome, Amit. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's just a Monday. We have the whole week for investing and, uh, and you know, looking forward to kind of uh, chatting pretty soon. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's been my pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And as with um, any investing discussion, you know, I have to end it with the disclaimer of uh, these are my opinions. Uh, and there's no financial advice in here. So definitely do your own research before uh, buying and selling stocks and crypto. For sure. For sure. Thank you so much. Amit. Have a nice day. Thank awesome. You. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.